Welcome to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction Podcast, where fans of classic fantasy adventures can hear the serialized audiobooks of a fellow nerd and indie author completely for free. I'm your author, narrator, and host, Brandon Wilborn. Thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome to my story. The story portion is going to start about the minute and a half mark if you just want to jump ahead, but let's recap first. Last week in Chapter 2 of The Treasure of Capric, we met Lord Evasius and his witch, Muna. Evasius' soldiers attacked Capric Hill to take the treasure the monks protect. When Curian and his friends reach the monastery, they find the compound still burning, with several of their brothers wounded or killed. To everyone's surprise, the abbot sends Curian, Tobin, and Rhys away that very night to negotiate with Lord Evasius. Later, Evasius receives his prize from Captain Nicholas Fallon but his victory is cut short when he discovers that the most precious item the Capricks protect has already been stolen. This week I'll be reading Chapter 3. If you've ever been at a dinner party with an agenda, that's where Curian's at. Now I present for your enjoyment, The Treasure of Caprick. Chapter 3. Pollingham Castle Curian felt his belly grumbling well before it was light, but he didn't want to be the one to stop them because he was tired and hungry. Even in the dark, it was easy enough to follow the horse tracks from Evasius' army. He could feel the difference in the ground under his feet, where the horses had beaten the grass into a pockmarked trail. Nothing else moved in the night, and they walked in silence. Their footsteps wove together into a rhythm that called him toward sleep, the long, heavy gait of Rhys, his own steady tread, and Tobin's soft, quick padding. They continually drifted closer, then further from a matching cadence. It comforted Curian to know that his friends were with him on this lonely walk through the silent, dark plain. Their presence made the chaos they had just left feel like a dream. Memories of their years training together seemed more real than the smoke he could still smell on his robes. These friends were what made the order worth the sacrifice. They were why he wanted so badly to gain ordination, and why the threat of losing that troubled him so much. Exile would mean losing his home his purpose, and his brothers, whom he had known longer than any family. Tobin spoke first, asking to rest and drink some water as the dawn slowly filtered light down on the plain. They did not stop to eat until well into the morning. Their last meal had been the afternoon before, in Appiford, and that had been a meager lunch. Curian felt like he could eat the entire sack of rations that Master Humphrey had given them, but he restrained himself to eat just enough to curb his hunger. With any luck, they would eat better at the castle than they ever did at the Order's compound. It was possible that Lord Evasius had enough wealth to make even his rudeness seem like lavish hospitality. The Lord of Pollingham had an extravagant but violent reputation. Through lunch, Tobin and Rhys tried to recall whom they recognized among the fallen the night before. Curian spoke little. The look that the abbot had given them remained in his mind, and he wondered whether there was a greater purpose to their mission. Each time he thought about the rejection of his request for ordination, it stirred his anger again. It seemed as if Sage Martin had been playing with them by delaying his answer. The anger of Noman only made it more suspicious. They had given each other strange looks, as if they had been having an entirely different conversation without speaking a word. Curian wanted to know what that conversation was, and why the abbot was willing to break the rules of their order so flagrantly over such an important issue as the treasure they protected. What do you think was happening last night? Curian asked after they had been walking again for a while. That is, between the dean and the abbot. All I know is Dean Goodman got his tassels tangled, Reese said. Usually that makes me happy, his voice trailed off. But why did Sage Martin send us out here without ordination? It doesn't bother me, said Reese. I know I'm not making it for another year at least. This is just something special because the compound got attacked. If they want to give me a real weapon because of that, it's all right by me. He kissed the bronze headpiece on his new staff. I don't think so, Curian said. Sage Martin had no reason to send us instead of a full brother, or going himself. We could have easily taken over somebody else's post helping to fight the fire or tend the wounded. He thought Evasius would go easy on us, Rhys said on account of we're so young and innocent-looking. That's hard to believe, Corinne scoffed. Tobin trotted up from behind. You're right to wonder. I've been thinking about the problem myself. This sort of breach of the rule is well beyond a loose interpretation during a crisis. The abbot broke one of the major points of the order clean through. His hair flapped across his brow as he shook his head. 
What do I care? Asked Reese. Nobody's going to know that unless you open your big mouth. Tobin scoffed. Curian knew it meant a lecture was coming. You should care, Tobin answered, stabbing a finger toward Reese. It calls into question everything about this mission and the abbot's motives. Even in previous crises, novitiates have always been ordained before undertaking any priestly task, though an abbreviated ceremony is usually used. Tobin's voice rose almost to a screech. There is no reason why Sage Martin could not have taken a few minutes to perform the rite with us. I can think of one, Korean said. He still felt the disappointment burning in his gut like hot lead. I can think of several, Tobin almost screamed. Tears carved streaks of pale flesh through the grime on his cheeks. They don't think we're able to become monks, said Kurian. Noman threatened just a day ago to make us gyro of eggs. He felt the hot liquid in his belly churning into anger. I'm not sure they ever intend to ordain me. Maybe Noman just wants to torture me for a few more months before he rejects me outright. Then what will I do? Reese wrapped an arm around Kurian's shoulder. The dean can't do it over the abbot, and he likes you. I saw how the abbot looked at us last night, Kurian said through his teeth. He thinks we're hopeless children, and he's sending us to play with a snake. That is the more worrying prospect, Tobin said quietly. Kurian and Reese stopped walking and stared at him. What do you mean? Kurian asked. I might know our history and law inside and out, but diplomatic training doesn't start until after ordination. And while you might have a knack for convincing people to go your way, I doubt you can outwit a leader like Avasius, even with my help. I'm still not following, Reese said. Abbot Martin may have sent us because we would fail. And what does that mean? Kurian asked. It could mean a lot of things, Tobin said, shaking his head. Maybe Sage Martin has given up on the order. It's been waning for generations, Tobin paused. A cool wind from the east caused him to shiver. Or it could mean he's working with Evasius. What? Reese said. You've lost it, mate. No, said Kurian. It makes some sense. However, that would mean that the abbot was planning for the fall of the entire order by Evasius's hand. I can't believe that. Even if Evasius promised him a large portion of our treasury, or lands and titles? Tobin asked. The wind blew harder, pushing aside a bank of fog, and Pollingham Castle came into view for the first time. The stout gray tower, perched on its outcropping of rock, was the largest structure any of them had ever seen. But from a distance, the castle looked empty and cold. Curian could not imagine the abbot joining with a man like Lord Evasius, who had such a cruel reputation. The abbot might think of them as children, but he had always been the kindest of the old monks. Until last night. It just feels wrong, he said to Tobin. I think he really does expect us to fail, and then he can banish us. The anger simmering inside of him suddenly boiled into rage. He as good as cursed us, Kurian yelled. No, said Tobin, shaking his head. It's not as bad as that. Perhaps he's given us the perfect opportunity. If we succeed, he can't help but ordain us. It would be just like Simon the Younger when he saved a whole troop of brothers by killing a den of lions. Now you're dreaming, Reese laughed. Perhaps if we pray before we continue, God will give us a miracle, Tobin said hopefully. I don't know if those happen anymore, Kurian whispered, but he joined hands with his friends and bowed his head. This close to the castle, the plain turned into small hills dotted with large boulders. The soft grass now hid sharp rocks that tripped them, and Curian kicked them more than once, letting out a grunt of pain. Soon Lord Avasius's castle stood before them, jutting from the hills like the hilt of a blade thrust into the earth. They approached from the north, where a narrow road led up the rock face toward a large gate in the main wall. Guards stood beside a smaller gate where the road began its ascent. They asked only a few questions before they let Curian and his friends through to follow the winding road to the top. Pollingham Castle looked even larger when standing directly below it in the late afternoon. The stout tower rose far above their heads, and it hurt to crane their necks back to try to see the top. At the north gate, a slick black moss clung to every stone, making the walls look more like the hide of a filthy, sweating giant than of quarried stone. An odor of peat smoke saturated each breath as they got close to the walls. Standing at the gate, 
It seemed as if they should be able to see farther out over the plain, but the hills and boulders strewn below dissolved into a gray sheet only a couple miles in the distance. Curian felt like he was going blind looking back toward his home. Once inside the main wall, the castle did not look much different from the compound at Caprick. Thatched roof stone buildings stood on either side of a narrow street, and people walked up and down the street on various chores. However, the details of the place were very different. Unlike at Caprick, the people did not greet each other as they passed, and garbage littered the streets. The smell of human and animal waste mingled with the peat smoke to assault their senses, and as they walked to the tower entrance, they passed more than one man lying drunk against a wall. According to the teachings of the Order, such men should hide themselves in shame. But of course, the Order also taught that their commission gave them special protection in the world, and that had proven false already. He didn't want to think of what happened here at night. Kurian could not believe this was the seat of power in Pollingham. He wondered how the ten cities could allow themselves to be ruled from a single small castle where such debauchery was on display in the middle of the afternoon. He had long suspected there was a reason the Order had lost power and influence for decades, and now he thought part of that reason was the condition of the people outside of their local influence. He tried to keep a vague, unreadable expression on his face. He wasn't sure that even a priest could help the people he saw here, but he didn't want them to see that. He had to elbow Tobin, who gawked at everything that his training had taught him was offensive. Try not to react so much, Kurian said quietly. How are we supposed to win over Evasius when even the drunks can read your thoughts? Tobin blushed and raised the hood on his robe to cover his face. Kurian heard him praying softly and hoped that it would help them to survive this place. It didn't matter what was waiting for them. They would be unprepared. When they reached the tower, the porter called an armed escort. Three tall men in tarnished armor walked close behind them, their hands lingering on the hilts of their swords. Kurian was surprised that they were allowed to keep their staves, but after such a successful attack, Evasius probably thought they posed no threat. While the porter led them through identical passages toward an unknown destination, he stammered about how infrequently monks had visited the castle. The porter promised that they would see Lord Evasius, but after the fourth turn down an indistinguishable hallway, Kurian began to wonder if he weren't leading them toward the dungeon. He finally stopped and opened a small door that Reese had to stoop to get through. Please wait here until my lord calls for you. Feel free to refresh yourselves with anything you find. He bowed lightly and left before they could thank him. Their armed escort closed the door but remained outside. Kurian looked around the small waiting room. There were two chairs and a stone bench in front of a window. Next to it was a table with a jug of water and a plate of bread and cheese. The condition of the food convinced him that the room was infrequently used. Any hidden hopes for a robust meal vanished. Reese picked up the bread and offered some to Tobin before dropping it back on the plate with a clang. What hospitality, he said dryly. Fortunately, we have no need of it, Korean said. Do you suppose we are prisoners or just unwelcome guests? In either case, Tobin answered, I suggest we review our strategy before we are summoned. Tobin reviewed which laws and ordinances of the old kingdom might best make their case, while Reese stretched out on the stone bench and snored. Kurian was amazed at his ability to sleep anywhere. They waited over an hour before the door opened, and a man dressed in embroidered silks entered the room. I am Lord Evasius's attendant, the man said. He apologizes for the condition of the room, and he hopes that you will understand it is merely an indication of how poorly our land fares, and not a slight against you or your venerated order. Kurian wanted to point out the irony of such respectful words from the man who had just set fire to their home, but he restrained himself and adopted the posture that he had seen the monks take in Apiford. We gratefully accept whatever hospitality our host offers, and do not wish to be a burden, he said, bowing slightly. Lord Vasius will see you now, said the attendant, and stepped out of the room. This time they ascended what seemed like unending stairways, even for boys who had grown up climbing the steep slope of Caprick. Their armed shadows followed closely behind, so that they could only move forward. The attendant reached the top of the stairs and stopped at a large set of double doors. It is nearly time for supper, so my master has asked me to bring you to his private chambers. He often eats here while conducting business in the evenings. He opened the doors and raised his voice slightly. My lord, the three Capricks who have come to see you. They entered a room dominated by a desk on one side. 
In a long, curved wall, large windows behind the desk let in the fading evening light and showed the hunched silhouette of a man writing. Across from the windows was a door that Curian assumed led to the bedroom. One moment, said the figure, who made one more brusque flourish with his quill before setting it aside and standing up. He moved quickly toward them with a long stride that made the open robes he wore flow softly behind him. Very good, Geoffrey, he said to his attendant, before turning his attention to the boys. The ruler's youth surprised Curian. Ivacius couldn't be over forty, but for some reason he had been expecting a man almost as old as Sage Martin, and perhaps more bent and stooped with cruelty. But he had a vitality and strength about him that was almost appealing, and the surprise on his face when he looked at his visitors was disarming. The man looked honest enough that in different circumstances, Curian would want to trust him. You didn't tell me they were so young, Geoffrey. Forgive the oversight, my lord, Geoffrey said. He bowed and stepped back to stand by the door. Farron Ivasius. He smiled at the boys and bowed deeply. Curian Abramson, my lord. Curian bowed in return. Allow me to introduce my companions, Rhys Brock and Tobin Hart. You honor us with an audience. Ivasius clapped his hand on Curian's back. There is no need for such formalities. You boys must be exhausted and hungry after your long walk. Please, sit and eat with me. He guided them over to another table and waved to Geoffrey. At his signal, servants brought in trays of steaming food and jugs of wine. The room suddenly filled with the scent of freshly baked bread and roasted meat. There was also a plate with fresh cheese, butter, and honey, along with several dishes of roasted squash from the recent harvest. Curian could feel his mouth begin to water. He waited for his host to sit down first, and then all three of them found chairs around the table. From the way he eyed the food, it was obvious that Reese could barely restrain himself from eating the first thing he could grab. I know some of the customs of your order, Evasius said cheerfully. Would you please offer a blessing for our humble fare? Curian tried to study his face, but could not read anything sinister in it. Of course, Ivasius had reason to be cheerful with the new riches he had stolen. Curian bowed his head cautiously, leaving his eyes just the tiniest bit open so that he was not entirely blind. If only he could ask Tobin to handle this part, but Ivasius had asked him, and he could not refuse. God, we thank you for the generosity of our host and the meal you've provided. We pray that you bless this food to secure our health and that you give back to this household a blessing that multiplies the kindness shown to us. Curian paused. The formula that he had learned for blessing a meal was complete, but he felt an urge to add a few more thoughts. He glanced quickly at Avasius. Confidence seemed to pour out of the man, even with his head bowed. We also thank you, God, that you have brought us before a man with an open and gracious heart, and we pray that you guide our conversation toward a just conclusion that is within your revealed will. It felt like a risky, presumptuous move, and he glanced at Evasius again, but saw no effect. Let it be. The other men echoed his final words, and Evasius reached for Curian's cup to fill it with wine. Then he stopped. Forgive me. Does your order drink wine? We are allowed whatever our host offers us, except during a fast, Tobin said. Excellent, Evasius said and filled Curian's cup to the brim. Reese reached for a tray of meat and filled his plate, then tore off almost half a loaf of bread for himself. Tobin carefully followed their training and etiquette and took only a small amount of food, waiting to eat only as much as their host. Curian decided to follow his example and mimic Evasius as he ate. Lord Evasius, Curian said, we appreciate your hospitality, especially since you must know why we came. Evasius took a portion of meat and set down the tray, then folded his hands together on the table. His slender figure made it clear that the man was disciplined with his food and his body. Yes, he said, it is obvious you have come about that unfortunate misunderstanding yesterday evening. Would my lord be kind enough to enlighten me on what was misunderstood? Corian looked for irony in his face, but he showed a perfectly measured expression of contrition. I send my men to speak with your abbot about the drastic needs in our land. As you must know, there has been a prolonged drought, and the people struggle just to survive. He paused as if waiting for agreement. Curian only nodded. For my part, it is almost impossible to supply enough men to keep the peace 
and protect the people with what little taxes come in. Vagabonds roam the countryside freely in some areas. An expression of deep concern accompanied the speech. And that is not even to speak of the other costs of governing. Forgive my ignorance, Kurian said, but how exactly does this relate to yesterday eve? Taxes, my dear boy. Evasius smiled kindly as one speaking to an ignorant child. It was almost the same luck the abbot gave them the night before. I wanted to ask your abbot for aid in bolstering the tax rolls. After all, your order does retain the largest collection of wealth in Pollingham, larger than my treasury has ever been. That was the case, Curian said flatly. That was the misunderstanding, Evasius boomed, ignoring the attempt at goading him. My men were over-eager and thought that my orders were to take the treasure when only a little bit freely shared would ease the burden of us all. I thought that your sage Martin would understand the necessity of providing for the public with peace and welfare. I am, in the end, simply a servant, as he is. My lord, you do understand that our treasury primarily holds gifts given to God, Tobin said. Curian could hear the slight tremble of fear in his voice and was sure that Evasius heard it too. I do, said Evasius, lowering his voice. However, you must understand that my aim was for the good of the people. Curian saw an instant where the facade cracked in Evasius's expression. He was angry with Tobin for challenging his motives, but it was gone as soon as Curian noticed. Certainly, God would agree that a little bit of treasure is better used for a noble cause than just sitting in an old monastery gathering dust. He looked almost like a merchant at a stall, trying to sell inferior goods to a discriminating buyer. Our abbot would know better than we would regarding God's preferences, Curian said. Are you also aware that several of our brothers are dead after last night, and that half our compound was damaged? Evasius looked down with every indication of sadness. I was told that there was a struggle. I believe it only made my men more determined to bring back as much as they could. However, I am happy that your abbot was sensible and intervened before there was more bloodshed. He picked up his cup and sipped at it. Curian was certain that he fully understood his mind about whose blood would have been shed. None of them said anything. Rhys had already cleared his plate and was piling on more food. Curian looked at Tobin in the silence, trying to find some guidance to get through Evasius's defenses, but Tobin only shrugged. Evasius swallowed loudly. Don't worry, my friends. I will send some men back to your compound to return the bulk of your treasury tomorrow. I only wish to retain a small portion to pay my armies through the winter. However, I must still humbly request that your abbot be willing to offer a portion of any future gifts he receives for matters of state. In difficult times, we must all struggle together. At that, he shoved a forkful of meat into his mouth and took a gulp from his cup. Curia noticed the emphasis on paying soldiers. Perhaps my knowledge of the law is incomplete, he said but I believe all monastic orders have been exempt from taxation since the time of Finn. Evasius set his mug down too firmly and rattled the plates on the table. Curian had uncovered his anger again. The rest must be a deception, but Curian was unsure what he was hiding. Unfortunately, my young friend, things must sometimes change. Evasius was smiling, but his eyes looked as if he wanted to burn Curian to ashes. Curian lowered his eyes and feigned deference. We are grateful that you are willing to return much of our treasury, and we apologize for our order's part in the misunderstanding, my lord. Evasius had time to restore his mask of kindness, and he shook his head as if no apology were needed. If my lord knows anything about our order, then he must know that we protect a very particular item above all else in our treasury. My lord may keep whatever else of the treasury he wishes, if we might receive this one item and return it safely to our brothers tonight. Ah, Evasius nodded. The fabled treasure of the Caprix. That is an enigma. In what way? asked Curian. Boys, 
I must let you in on a secret. When my men returned and told me what had happened, I searched all the chests and boxes they brought for that most important of treasures. I wanted to secure it in my own vaults to ensure its safety, since I assumed that your order would send someone to retrieve it. It was not there. Kurian suddenly felt like he would vomit. Reese dropped his fork, his mouth hanging open. What? said Kurian. How? That treasure has been protected by our order for centuries. Believe me, I was as surprised as you were, Evasius said. He rose from the table and walked over to his desk. When he returned, he dropped a scrap of parchment in front of Kurian. There was one chest that held only an ornate box. I had never seen such a beautiful piece, so I assumed that the treasure was inside. It was only fitting to store it in such splendor. When I opened it, all that I found was this note. Kurian realized that he was clenching his fists. He had to struggle to open his hands to pass the yellow parchment to Tobin. It was impossible to hide that his hands were shaking. I don't understand. I'm sorry to tell you that your treasure was taken. Evasius looked genuinely concerned again. It was clear to Kurian that this was the secret he was hiding, but he was uncertain about Evasius's reaction. How long ago? I don't know. But if the note is true, I do know who took it, and I know that it is imperative that it be returned. If the visions that inspired your order were true, then the security of our land rests on your treasure. Who took it? Reese growled. I recognized the symbol immediately. There has been a bandit raiding my supply carts almost every month. In each case, no more than one or two of my men return alive. The stories about him are horrifying. Most of the men who return to me never speak again, but they all draw that symbol. A few have come back muttering, calling him the king of the caves. He strikes at any place he chooses and vanishes like a phantom. We have never been able to discover his camp. Is that all you know about him? Kurian asked. We have never heard any stories about this bandit. I try to keep the stories from spreading when he attacks, Evasius said. The people would panic to learn that there was a villain pillaging the most heavily guarded supply transports at will, leaving almost no survivors. If he is a ghost, then it would seem the treasure is lost, Kurian said. He had to fight back the anger and tears that wanted to well up and he looked out the window where night had fallen. One question burned in his mind until he almost forgot about the man he was supposed to be negotiating with. Did Sage Martin know? Evasius looked intently at Kurian. He was smiling again, but this time he looked like a cat about to pounce on his prey. Perhaps it is not yet lost. I would like to offer you young men a deal. What sort of deal? It is vital to the realm that this treasure be returned. Obviously, my men have looked for leads and interrogated people thought to have information about this thief, but we have not discovered his whereabouts. Evasius brought his fingers together under his lips. We have one piece of information about a man whom we think knows where the King of the Caves is located. Perhaps if monks from a celebrated order were to question him, they would have more success than my soldiers. You want us to find the treasure. What do you get from it? You only need to get me the information, and my men will do the rest. As for what I get, I get to restore order to my people when my troops bring him to me for justice. However, I also want the treasure to remain in my castle, under the guard of brothers from your order, of course. But that would go against the prophecy of God and centuries of law and tradition, Tobin said, horrified. Clearly the order has not been able to protect it within their compound, Evasius said calmly. I merely want to help ensure that it is never stolen again. Forgive our reluctance, said Kurian, but I am not certain that we have the authority to make such a decision. From what I understand of your order, any monk sent on a diplomatic mission has the full authority of the abbot. Kurian looked at Tobin, who nodded slowly as his face went pale. 
Evasius had cornered them into making an impossible decision. It looked as if they would fail in returning to Capric with the treasure they had sworn to protect. Curian felt his throat tightening at the prospect and took a sip of wine to clear it. This deal sounds rather one-sided, my lord. From the time we were seven years old, we all took an oath to protect the treasure where it lay. As you have seen, I can be gracious, Evasius said, turning toward the table of food. In return for your services, I will order my men to assist in rebuilding your compound. And I will revoke my request for a portion of your income. In fact, I will issue an edict that confirms my own commitment to your order's exemption from all taxes as long as my line rules. He raised his glass as if to make a toast. And if your oath is that important to you, then I will insist that Abbot Martin make you three my personal delegates to lead the guardians posted here. Reese looked as if he thought this was a fair deal. The position and chance for honor were what mattered to him, and the food was better here. Tobin shook his head slightly, trying to hide it from Evasius. While Curian had expected to be unprepared, the circumstances seemed to make their original mission meaningless. Evasius had talked them into a corner, especially since he knew the rules teaching about diplomatic missions. Now he was attempting to bribe and manipulate them into promising the impossible. However, the fact that they weren't monks might mean he could agree to anything and the abbot could rescind any of it. Of course, he would have to break the rule's orders about promises and oaths to do it. But the rule offered no guidance in such a contorted situation. In the end, finding that treasured item was all that mattered. It was his only chance to remain in the order and fulfill his purpose to be a guardian. And perhaps Tobin was right. If the abbot didn't know the treasure had been missing, they would instantly gain ordination by snatching it from the hands of a notorious criminal. He took a deep breath before speaking again. It appears our only choice is to accept your offer, if we hope to keep our order intact. However, our abbot may need further assurances, Curian said. Once the decision was made, he felt lighter, and he was able to take the last bite from his plate. Wonderful, Evasius said. I have a room prepared for you, and I will send you on a carriage in the morning to find the man we suspect. He stood up and the boys rose as well. Tobin looked at Curian, and he knew that there would be a long discussion once they were alone. Geoffrey opened the door to lead them to their room, but Evasius called them before they were gone. Just out of curiosity, would you know the treasure if you saw it? I wouldn't want the King of the Caves to deceive us when we capture him. Only the abbot is allowed to view the treasure. Well then, just in case you get close, I will tell you that I have had scribes dig up what they could about your treasure from the royal archives. They tell me that the treasure is probably a book. The boys each looked surprised. This won't be an ordinary book by any means, Evasius continued. It will obviously be very old, but its contents are unknown. Based on the stories that surround it, like the one about the founding of your order, it must be a thing of great power. Personally, I believe that it may hold the answers to all the mysteries of the world. Truly, that would be a power worth protecting. We cannot know what the King of the Caves might do with it, and so we must retrieve it to keep all of Pollingham safe. Corian was speechless, unsure whether he even believed what he was hearing, he could only nod as Evasius spoke. Certainly your order would not want a thief and a murderer to wield the power to control everything. Before any of them could respond, Lord Evasius nodded to Geoffrey, who closed the door and hurried them back down the tower stairs. Okay, a couple of the puzzle pieces coming together. We know now that the King of the Caves is the one who stole the treasure and left that mysterious note. But is he friend or foe? He's obviously someone who interferes with Evasius' plans, but he also took the treasure from the Caprix. We also know a little bit more about the treasure. It's a book. But what sort of book? Join me next Friday and we'll see how Curian does on his mission from Lord Evasius as a sort of unintentional double agent.
In the meantime, send me a note if you want to weigh in on who this King of the Caves is, or what type of book the treasure might be. Thank you so much for listening, especially this week, because this is a very dialogue-heavy chapter. It's probably one of the longest, and it's probably the reason that I get a lot of reviews saying that the book starts off a little slow. Trust the reviews and trust me when I say that from here it gets a lot more exciting and action-packed with each chapter, and it goes faster and faster right up until the end. There's no extra content this week because I've got a little boy's birthday party to get ready for, and I've been invited to speak at my first uh, high school graduation to do the convocation. So it's an adventure time for me. I hope you'll join me again next week. Thanks again for joining me. If you have questions about the story or the writing or anything else you'd like me to answer in one of the Behind the Keyboard segments, just send me a message or leave me a voicemail at brandonwilborn.com forward slash contact. If you're enjoying this podcast, please subscribe and give the show a five-star rating. Second, find another fantasy lover and share it with them, whether by word, text, email, social media, or a smoke signal. Thanks again for listening to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction Podcast. The Treasure of Caprick is available in print and ebook formats from all major booksellers. You can find a link to your favorite retailer in the show description, or just go to brandonwilborn.com. That's brand on, not brand off, and Wilborn as simple as you can make it. W-I-L-B-O-R-N. Until next time, Godspeed. This has been The Treasure of Caprick, book one of The King of the Caves, written and narrated by Brandon M. Wilborn. Copyright Brandon M. Wilborn.